Okay, so remember where we've traveled so far. So what we did so far is we, we built our foundation of leadership character. Now we're going to move into talking about leadership behaviors. And uh, one thing I, I wanted to say before I share this specifically is just that, uh, you know, as I look around the room, I see people who have a lot of, you know, a reasonable amount of life experience. So I'm sure you relate to what I'm going to say right now which is, in this area of leadership, I feel like um, you know, early in my career at Procter & Gamble, if I were to ask myself, have I been an effective leader this week, my answer would have been, I have no idea if I've been an effective leader, because leadership is this like, really big word that involves a lot of different things. And I think the real power of what I'm going to share with you, the real power to me, when some of these principles were shared with me years ago is being able, being able to break leadership down into, I might say, bite-sized chunks. You know what I mean? You know, pieces that I can really wrap my mind around and I can assess myself and I can know, is that something I do well or is that something that I need to grow in? So I, I hope as I share this with you that the fact that it's a, a simple framework and hopefully, at least in English, a memorable framework. I hope you can take this with you and, and really even learn and think this evening about where your opportunities for growth are and, and what you do pretty well. So here you go. This is our six point model. And you can see on the left hand side that it conveniently spells the word leader. <clears throat> on the right hand side you can think about that as a description of the role of leadership that this includes, okay? So I'll just go down the right-hand side for simplicity. One of the first roles, first and most important roles of a leader is to be a visionary, all right? Second is to be a collaborator, to engage with others. Third is to be someone who is an inspirer, activating the passion inside of other people. Fourth, the builder, and by this we mean builder of capability in those who are following. The finisher, in a way, this is the role of the manager, setting up the strategies and plans to deliver the vision. And then the last one is, remember, success is never defined in the short term. Success is best defined in the long term. And so we need to sustain the, the accomplishment of the vision. All right. So we're going to take these one by one, and uh, just, just to give you a, a quick view of what's coming, we are going to spend more time on laying out a vision and activating passion, the inspirer. My experience over the years is that these are areas that include equal parts art and science, <laughs> right? So there, there are some technical things you can do but there's a certain element of it that's a little harder to wrap your mind around. So I thought, especially this evening with an experienced group, I thought that's probably the best place to invest our time is in those two areas. We'll, uh, we'll be covering the other ones somewhat more briefly. All right, laying out a vision. So I want to start with another quote from, uh, from Mr. Kennedy here. And Kennedy said, back in 1961, he said, I believe this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. I think if I was an astronaut, I would have been hanging on those last few words, right? I hope this is a round trip ticket, not a one way trip. All right, so he said these words in 1961. and. Uh, Okay, is anybody willing to admit they were on the planet in 1961? Anyone? Hey, all right, Drajan. <laughs> I, I arrived on the planet in 1962, so I, I wasn't quite here yet. But uh, in 1961, when Kennedy said these words, think about where technology was at that time. There was hardly any real technology the way that we know it today. And uh, think for a moment Let's, let's say for a moment, Emil, that you are working for NASA, okay? And you see, at this point, you're working for NASA, you know where technology is, you know how impossible the task of getting to the moon 
and back is, what would you be thinking when you heard these words? What do you think, Camille? Uh, maybe it's earlier to help us. Maybe what? Earlier to take the care. Yeah, 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 okay. There's, there's some help needed. <laughs> maybe he can roll up his sleeves and help. Well, let me tell you what I'd be thinking. I know exactly what I would be thinking if I heard him say this. It would be something like this. I would go to one of my colleagues and I would say, can you believe what the boss just said? Is he crazy? Does he have any idea where we are and how impossible this is going to be? What is he thinking? I think that's probably what, what I would have said. But I hope, I hope, after I said that, I would say this. Let's get busy. <laughs> and a lot of people, hundreds and thousands of people, got busy after he said this, this crazy big vision. And sure enough, in 1969, before the decade was out, this vision was actually accomplished. So I, I think this is a, really a, it's a very familiar story, I know, but I think it's a great example of how a vision, a stretching vision, can mobilize people to really get something done. So I have another, uh, another person I want to share with you. Do you know this person? Excuse me. Yeah, I can, uh, I can introduce you if you don't know this person. <laughs> so let me try this, okay? Maria Yurich Zagorka. Did I get it? Yeah? yeah? Close enough? Yeah. <laughs> You're not so sure. <laughs> She, uh, she points out another really important part of being a visionary. She says, happiness has to come. The sun is behind the clouds. It has to get clear. We must just wait and believe it is coming. So she's offering a spirit of optimism and a spirit of hope. She's saying, hey, we, we can get there. Let's hang in there just a little bit longer. Steve Jobs. Everybody knows about Steve Jobs. I expect no one has heard this specific quote before. But it's an important one for our message tonight. He says, creativity is just connecting things. That's all it is. When you ask a creative person how they did something, they feel a little guilty. Because they didn't really do it. They just saw something. They connected. And they synthesized new things. Got that? All right. I'll come back to that in just a few minutes. So how do I lay out a vision? Well, the first thing I do when I'm laying out a vision is I want to make sure I'm focused externally. In a manner of speaking, I'm not focused on what's going on in the room. I'm focused on what's going on outside of the room. And I'm, I'm looking at what I, what I see out there, but not focused so much on what I see, focused more on what's causing what I see. What are the trends and the factors what are, the, what are the forces that are driving what I'm seeing when I look externally? So I have an opportunity for you guys to participate right now. Are you willing? Okay. Thanks for being so willing tonight. <laughs> Especially when you have no idea what I'm going to ask you to do, right? So uh, I, have a, I have an opportunity for you. I would like for each of you to serve as the chief executive of the Procter & Gamble Company. Okay? Are you willing? <laughs> it's too late. You already collectively said yes. Okay. So I want you to serve in this way if you're willing, and, uh, and even if you're not. <laughs> and uh, what I want you to do, well, first of all, congratulations on your promotion. Okay? <laughs> this is a, it's a big paycheck, but it's a big responsibility. Okay. And what I want you to do is I want you to tell me and some of your seminar participant fellow participants here, I want you to, to share some ideas on what you, as the CEO of P&G, should be focused on externally. What are you looking at so that you can make sure the long-term vision of Procter & Gamble is in the right place? What do you think? Ideas? We want all our brands and all households. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's a good vision. So what are you looking at externally? Are you looking at households to see if our products are there? 
Yeah, I mean, you're looking at our you're looking at our, our market share results, you know, to see how many households the product is in. What what are you looking at? What are other things externally? Come on, you guys have a big paycheck to earn. I mean, <laughs> I'm expecting big things here, especially from you because you threw the ball at me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> What makes us special? Innovations. Innovations that are going on? What makes us special? Maybe considering others. Yeah, so maybe look at competition. What is unique and special about us? Why should we expect to win, right, when we look at our competition? Yes? Um, the, the people needs, what uh, the community needs. Oh, ah, okay, all right. So maybe do some surveys to understand. To be innovative, we have to uh, find out what they need so we can meet that need. Great. Or to create a new need. Ah, okay. Good. So what you're saying is we need to be in touch with our consumers, right? What else? Other ideas? Demographic trends. Excellent. Excellent. So let me share with you a few other ideas. You said some of these. <clears throat> Demographic trends. Um, what are some other things? Uh, educational trends. You know, what, what do our consumers know? What are they being taught? How are they being shaped? Uh, environmental trends, of course, is an important one. Uh, global trade, foreign exchange rates. You know, it's all those kind of things that the CEO of P&G should be focused on. I want to I want to comment on one that I think is kind of interesting. You know, Procter Gamble is a company that makes diapers. So why would a company that makes diapers care about fashion trends? We want to make sure we have stylish babies. Is that it? Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, I can think of one other one other reason beyond that. Go ahead, huh? Sure, the diapers can fit in the small purse. Of there you go. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Maybe the maybe the size of purse. Uh, that trend is an important one. But I want to focus on one that, uh, as I look around this room. I'm getting even more concerned about this fashion trend, actually. The fashion, the fashion trend, remember, we're a company that sells Gillette razor blades. Okay? And as I look at some of the men in the room, <laughs> you know who you are. <laughs> the more I look around, the more concerned I'm getting because <coughs> there's a certain fashion trend where people aren't shaving as much as they used to, right? And that's not a good thing for us when people are, are not shaving. So, uh, so yeah, washing your hair. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, at least keep washing your hair, even if you're not shaving. So, because I'm up here getting discouraged, uh, because I see a lot of people who are not obviously not using Gillette razor blades, I need to ask the men in the room: How many of you shaved today? Please give me some encouragement. Okay, good. Five, six, seven out of. Uh, out of however many men we have here. How so I am. Huh? How many women? Sorry, but that's such a I haven't yet. Yeah, I've not been asking. I've not been asking the women very many questions. Yeah, yeah, but it's not politically correct. Questions. It's true. It's just not as visible to me. <laughs> we better. We better. We better stop this right now. <laughs> so I, before we leave this point, I want to share a special message from the Procter and Gamble headquarters to those men who raised their hands just a minute ago. And that message is, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Even if we use electric? Well, we, have, we also have brawn. So electric, of course, yeah. electric is OK. All right. All right, so now the second thing that you want to do as a visionary is you want to break out of the box, OK? And we all know what that means. But what I want to tell you right now is when we did that exercise out there, just a few minutes ago with the ball, basically what was happening in the early stages of that game is I was putting you in a box, <laughs> all right? I put you in a circle, I told you to spread out, I told you to throw the ball, I told you to say a name, and you're all thinking, oh, this must be a game where I get to meet people, you know, or it's a, ball, it's a game that's defined by tossing a ball, right? And then we said, all right, now we're going to time you, and there's three rules. And we said the three rules were, begins and ends with the same person, touches everyone in the same sequence. And all of you heard those words, touches everyone in the same sequence, and you thought, okay, 
We need to throw the ball faster, right? And we can get closer and throw the ball shorter. But we, we have put you in the box of the game is throwing the ball to one another in this special sequence. And uh, the, uh, it, it, it takes so long to actually get to the point that you break out of that box. And, and one thing that I did along the way, which helped you and always does, is remember we were talking about the importance of having a big, almost unbelievable vision. Well, what happened? I stopped you at one point and I said, well, you're doing just fine. Wow, great progress, but some of the best teams have done it in this amount of time. And all of your eyes go, you know? <laughs> they get bigger, and you say, oh, we need to be thinking about this very differently. When you began to understand what was possible, it gave you a little extra incentive. It, it mobilized you to continue. So anyway, I, I, I just, I really want to encourage you in this area of breaking out of the box. It is, it is so easy for us to be in boxes that we have no idea we're even in. We are sometimes captive to our collective experience. You know, the experience we have is invaluable. Ron and I have a lot of experience. We also are probably in a lot of boxes, you know, because we, we only know a certain number of ways to do certain things. So really uh, ask yourself when you're participating on a team, you know, maybe have a candid discussion. Do some brainstorming as a team about what boxes are we probably in? You know, what, what can we do to, to step out of our boxes? All right, I want to give you one more quick illustration uh, of the power of this, and maybe a way to think about it in, in a business context. Might be helpful for you, a business application. So you all know the REO brand, yes? yes. You all use the REO brand, yes? Yes. Yes? Too expensive. Too expensive. All right. a good brand. All right, ladies, I have a question for you. <laughs> are you using the REO? And men, are you using the REO for him? All right, so let's, uh, let's do another illustration here where uh, we are a team, okay? I'm going to be the REO brand manager, and I want you to be the REO brand team. All right, so we're going to have our team meeting. I'm going to walk in, and I'm going to put down on the table a box of REO, and I'm going to say... We are the REO brand team. REO is soap in a box. And so, in a way, we are the soap in a box team. That's what we do. We sell soap in a box. Remember earlier we talked about success. Well, for us, success is selling more soap in a box today than we sold yesterday. And big success is selling even more tomorrow. All right? More soap in a box. So my question for you, team is what are your ideas on how we can sell more soap in a box? What do you think? I need ideas. Sports fashion. Hmm? Sports fashion. <laughs> okay. So maybe promote sport fashion, right? Where, where people are getting sweaty and the clothes are getting dirty. Yeah. So what are, what are some ideas? How can we sell more, more of this soap in a box? What can we do? Hmm? Make a smaller box, okay. That way people have to buy more boxes. <laughs> Make a travel size box. What else can we do? Find a new market, a new purpose for that. Same. Okay, okay. All right. Are there other ways you can use the product? I want to sell more soap in a box. I need ideas from this side now. A really bad thing is but to lower the quality of the soap, so you need more. <laughs> Dilute the soap. <laughs> we never do that. <laughs> oh, that's right. You think I'm retired, don't you? <laughs> you actually believe that story that I'm retired. Okay. What uh, other ideas? How can I sell more soap in a box? Maybe I can make it clean better. It's hard to imagine a soap that cleans better than REL, but, but maybe it cleans better. Maybe we change the package graphics. We change the advertising. Lots of things we can do. But here's the thing. If you think about all these ideas that we've talked about so far, consistent with the way I set this up, 
those ideas aren't really thinking outside of the, of the box of soap very much, are they? So if we want to think about this very differently, and the message for you who are in business, the message is really make sure you define your vision correctly. Because if instead of being a soap in the box company, if instead I came into the room for our team meeting and I said, all right team, here is a, here is a clean piece of clothing. I lay it on the table and I say, we are the REL brand team. REL is one product that is made to make sure that clothes are clean. We are all about making sure clothes in this world are clean. World's a better place when there's clean clothes, right? If we are the clean clothes company, what, what are some ideas for how we can grow a business like that? And what I'd like you to do, just real quickly, where you are, maybe we can have the front row turn around, the third row turn around, and we can form groups that way. I want you just to think about what are some ways, if, if you're thinking about our mission is to have more clean clothes out there, and that's our mission, to grow our company, then what are some ideas for how we might do that? So it's time now to think outside of this box of soap, okay? So let's just take a couple of minutes uh, for, for each of the groups that somebody could take notes in the group. Okay, so I'm expecting to have some great ideas to take back to Cincinnati. <laughs> okay. All right, we're ready? Listen up, everyone. You guys ready? All right. Hey, guys, listen up. Are we ready? Okay. So, who wants to share their best idea first? Best idea. No. Who wants to share? We will. Okay, go ahead. Okay, uh, spray for dry cleaning. Ooh. So when you travel somewhere and uh, in the way you get um, all the mess up, oh. you have the spray, you spray it and... Okay, good. How much are you going to charge for that product? Because I want to buy some, okay? <laughs> That's okay. I'm teasing. That's a good idea. So maybe a, a portable dry cleaning product. Yeah. So clean a different kind of clothes when you try one. Great. Yes, in the back. Hey, listen, everyone. Listen up. Go ahead. Okay. We did the market research. Oh. Uh, yes. And uh, we found out that the bio, uh, bio segments uh, on market is something that is uh, at the most low. Yes. So we decided to develop the whole new range, Equaria. Uh, with the new formula, green formula, etc. So we, we dealt with those uh, things we think uh, that we will be trends uh, okay. and we grow a minimum 30%. Whoa! Okay. <laughs> 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 Woo! 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 All right! <laughs> that one, listen up, that one came with a, a growth estimate. That was great. Is there anybody else? Did we get, did we catch all you guys or is there another idea? We got everybody? Okay. How about this side? What do you guys? What do you have? What's your idea? Uh, listen. listen. Uh, we will have like a laundry area, laundry places where you can uh, wash uh, clothes Great. with uh, Ariel. So it, you have more clean clothes and you sell Ariel. Excellent. Ariel, and we can franchise them. Oh, I love this. I love this. What percentage of growth will you achieve? <laughs> They said they had to, <laughs> they said 30% growth. How about you? <coughs> huh? More? Maybe 40%? Whoa, okay. All right. The group in the back. What is your idea? Listen, everyone. So, we had all of those ideas, but we decided that this, those are not that good. No, we are kidding. But uh, we, also, we also went with the ecological problem, but oh. not, uh, not so much about the environment, but for the person like that. Uh, so, it's good for you, for your skin, and uh, okay. using your product, using this product is like organic in some 
Fine. Makes Thank your you. skin glow. For, <laughs> for good reasons. For good reasons. Yeah. <laughs> for good reasons. Yeah. 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 Listen, everyone. Did you did you hear this idea? It's like a, a laundry detergent and shaver all in one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Cleans your clothes and removes your hair. <laughs> and you can also use it as aftershave. <laughs> <laughs> a three in one. I love a three in one. All right. Wow. Amazing did idea. Make it? Thank you. I can't wait to go back to Cincinnati and share <laughs> share those ideas. All right, here's a couple of other ideas for you, okay? Has anybody ever heard of the Threadsmiths Company? Yeah. 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 So they make shirts from Australia. They make shirts that don't, they, they clothes that don't stink. They're made out of aquaphobic materials, and uh, nothing absorbs into it, so they don't stink. So, you know, it would be bad news for Procter & Gamble <laughs> if a company like this... <laughs> right now, the good news for Procter & Gamble is these shirts are expensive. <laughs> But what happens on the day that these shirts are not expensive? Uh, what would happen to our sales of soap in a box? You know, that would be bad news for us. And another idea related, uh, preventing clothes from soiling. Maybe you've seen some of these products. They, they exist where you can spray it on your clothes and your clothes don't get clean. Or don't get clean. Don't get dirty. And the, the good news for P&G here is these products don't work very well. They're kind of messy. But... Uh, Someday these products will work well. Someday they won't be so messy. And I hope on that day when you go to the store and you pick up that product and you turn it around, it says made by <laughs> Procter and Gamble. All right. Here's another one I wanted to share. This one is really, I think this is maybe the best illustration of really thinking outside of the box. All right. Why are you looking at Mark Zuckerberg? We're having a conversation about laundry products, and we're looking at Mark Zuckerberg. Well, think about it. <laughs> Strike that from the tape. Uh, <clears throat> about, I don't know, 20 years ago, 15 or 20 years ago, when I worked at Procter & Gamble, I would go to work every day, and what did I wear? I wore a suit and I wore a tie. When people like Mark Zuckerberg, this was before his time, but when people like Mark Zuckerberg went to work out in the Silicon Valley of California, what did they wear? Well, at the end of the week, when, I, when my week was over and I had to get my clothes clean, where did I take them? Right. To the dry cleaner. At the end of the week, when Mark Zuckerberg, or people like him, had to wash their clothes, what did they use? I hope. <laughs> Are you? Well, an interesting thing happened about 15 or 20 years ago, which is uh, at Procter & Gamble, we were starting to realize that there were young graduates that we were recruiting, and they said, no thanks. I didn't, you know, love your company, don't want to wear a suit every day. I think I'll go out and be more casual and comfortable with my friends out in California. And it, it was a wake-up call for us. You know, we started thinking... Do we need to think about some things differently here? And then we started connecting some dots. Remember we talked about connecting thoughts? And we started connecting some things, and we thought, well, what if more people, not only within Procter & Gamble, but around our country, many other, many other companies in our country, and even around the world, follow what we do? You know, we're an influential company. And we thought, what if more people around the country and around the world started dressing like that instead of dressing like this? What could that do for the amount of clothes that would be dirty that needed to be cleaned by a product like Ariel? And so at some point, for a number of reasons, including the fact that we were losing recruits, we decided to change to a casual clothing policy. Not quite to this level. But we changed to casual clothing. And what did we do? We announced to the whole world <laughs> that we had made that change and you know, did as much as we could to, in, to encourage other people to do the same. And our, our laundry business for a number of years really reaped the benefit of having more, more of the kind of clothes that Ariel could clean 
getting dirty at the end of each work week. So you'd never think when you look at that picture that there's a, an opportunity to sell more Ariel, but that's the way it turned out. And of course, uh, there were still some bankers and lawyers and other people who still wore their suits every day, and so what did we do? More conventionally, we decided to create a Tide. You guys know Tide? You can tell later. Uh, we, create, we create a Tide uh, dry cleaners that is present today in a number of cities in the United States. Okay? All right. So that is an expansive view of thinking out of the box, and now I want to turn it over to Ron, who I hope has enough voice to uh, pick it up and run with it here. Ron? Do you want the mic? Well, first of all, Todd, I want to say thank you. Because I just remembered about 15, 20 years ago, I was wearing a suit and tie and hang with the Ford Motor Company. <laughs> and then they announced that we were going to go casual. Yeah. They did not know it was your points at B and G turning the entire Ford Motor Company to casual. But it's just a beautiful thing. We'll take the credit. Yeah. And it's all about you selling more out. Yeah. I thought it was for whatever it takes, right? Whatever it takes. It's a true story. It was right about the same time. And I, actually, I do remember the press releases too. Yeah. I yeah. do remember those. Uh -huh. so that was kind of neat. Um, so let's go back to <clears throat> creating a vision. Who in here thinks they are um, very creative? One, two, three. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. How about average creative? <laughs> How about just a little bit creative? <laughs> That's the most <laughs> Todd. <laughs> I'm probably in the middle. I'm probably in the little bit category myself. Um, so, so we put this slide up here to just kind of symbolize you. Creative people or not creative people can always think about connecting other ideas and learning and looking around to try to create and, and try not to do it um, out of the box, but in this case you do it in the box, thinking about um, what you could learn from other people. And the Steve Jobs quote early on, and one of the most creative companies in the world, he said, and they're not especially creative. They just connect and synthesize and they move forward. And, I, and as I thought about that uh, a little bit, it reminded me of, of Newton. Has anybody ever heard of the, you know, the Newton kind of story that the apple dropped and, and he thought about gravity? And then, but, but isn't that kind of a big, a big move? So we're going from an apple dropping out of a tree to this, this equation we have the masses of two objects multiplied together, divided by the, the square root of the distances, and then we get gravity. That's a pretty big stretch from an apple falling off a tree. Um, what Newton said about it was, if I've seen further, it's on his shoulders of giants. Anybody ever heard that statement? But what he's saying is, over time, Knowledge grows and, and grows and connects and grows and connects and then eventually it accumulates into something bigger. And so he was giving credit to all the people before him that he learned from. And no doubt that's probably where most of this formula came from. But, but he may have seen that before from a tree. I'm not sure. Um, and just one more comment on this. Uh, <clears throat> Henry Ford. Everybody's heard of Henry Ford? He was time man of the century, last century. Did, did anybody think he created the automobile? No, he didn't. He did not. <coughs> but at one time, his company had created more automobiles than anybody else. He was 60% of the automobiles in, in the world were created by Henry Ford mm -hmm. in the early years of his lifetime. He, he did create the assembly was, line. He created the assembly line, which ended up being the way to create automobiles very quickly, and effectively, and inexpensively. And so, although he wasn't, he didn't imagine an automobile, he certainly imagined how to create one and everyone could afford it. Number four, <clears throat> it comes to envisioning, uh, everybody knows this guy, Bill Gates? Pretty successful fellow, <laughs> just a little. And that we all appreciate what Microsoft has done for us in terms of our computer systems, operating systems, we're very familiar. This is what he says. You need to make it a priority. It takes two separate think weeks every year of his career. Jack Welch. Anybody ever heard of Jack Welch? Yes? 
So, so G uh, executive for, for a couple of decades. When he took over GE, um, their net worth was $12 billion. When he retired, anybody have any idea what their net worth was? $200 billion? Twice that, $412 billion. Um, and he says, one hour of look out the window time each day. He actually kind of coined this phrase, imagining. He was always imagining, well, what can we do next? So this is an interesting equation to help us think about involving others. It's quality equals rightness times ownership. So if we're 100% right and only 30% of our team owns the idea, we only have 30% quality. If we're 80% right but 100% of our team is with us and on board, it's 80% quality. So that, that kind of wraps up uh, the laying out a vision. What we'd like to do now is move to engaging others or the collaborator. So why is it important for a leader to be a good collaborator? Is it really important to be a good collaborator? Yeah, you can't do it by himself. That's true. You can't lead yourself, but maybe a middle of uh, be that a work can be done by yourself. Um, normally here, <clears throat> uh, I talk about an ancient Chinese proverb. And uh, anybody know any Mandarin at all? Uh, I teach a little bit. Uh, well, I, I can say the Chinese proverb in Chinese. <laughs> it's, it's Du Xing. Je Kuai, Zhong Jin, Zhong Jin, Zhu Yan. That's probably right. Oh, yeah, oh, that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 together. And I think that kind of uh, emphasizes the point of engaging others. If you want, you want to go far and do something big, the very best leaders, the very best leaders know how to engage people. So, how do we engage others? Let's talk about that. And I know Todd went through this and, 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 and did a nice job explaining uh, what it means to be a person of character. Um, but a person of character is a person that is trusted. Trust is the first element always when a team comes together. If you form a team of people who don't trust each other, how well are they going to get along? Maybe not at all. If you, if you um, meet a special person in your life and you want to develop a relationship with them, what's the first thing that has to happen? There must be some trust. Uh, so a person of high character is really the foundation of the absolute first step of engaging people. Uh, Sam Walton on building trust. Um, so everybody knows Walmart scores. <laughs> so this is something he did, which was pretty, pretty uh, important. In 1985, he says, I visited 750 Walmart stores, Wal Wal Walnut, Walmart stores. People often ask me why I feel the CEO should do this. My answer is simple. Do our store employees know I'm interested in them? I think you, you know, just discussed it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, that's a pretty big deal for a CEO. He's probably a busy guy. He's probably got a lot to do. But he felt it important enough to, to go visit everybody. You know, in my career at Ford Motor Company, um, I worked there 24 years, and I had never met the CEO. And we had at least three CEOs during that 24 years. And then Alan Mulally took over the company. And is it ever Alan Mulally? Mm -hmm. so, so he kind of saved our company when it was just about to go bankrupt in 2008. I met Alan Mulally every other year 
when he joined. So, I, so he was there eight years. I met him at least four times, I think five times. I've met with him, sat with him, had lunch with him once. That's it. So, so for me, as a Ford employee, who do you, what, are, what CEO do you think I really liked? Well, I don't even remember the names of the other three. <laughs> but I know that guy. But he showed, he showed, he, he built trust because he cared about us. So Abe Lincoln, <clears throat> certainly probably one of the um, most well-known presidents of the United States. Everybody's heard of Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty special guy. But, but from the uh, 1800s, Abe Lincoln said, "If you desire to win a man to your cause, first cause him to convince you him, convince you your sincere friend. After this." who have no trouble convincing him of the justice of your cause. One of the things that, 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 that Lincoln did, the reason we talk about him as a collaborator, was when he was running for office, it was, it was really tough. He had a lot of opposition. A lot of really smart, strong people were running against him. But somehow, some way, he won. So the first thing he did was appoint those top three opponents to captain offices so they could work with him. Even though they were a bit of his enemies, his competitors, he knew he could convince them that he would be a sincere friend and they would help him move the country forward. So create win-win. Everybody has heard of this, is that true? <coughs> is that something that, 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 just as a test, you all try to do is create a win-win all the time? Make sense? To try to explain it a little more clear, I thought I'd talk about what does a win-lose look like? Win, win, win. Somebody wins, somebody loses. Yeah, yeah. Does that feel good? It depends on what size it is. I'm with you. But if I'm a person who always wants to win and always wants you to lose, yeah. how are we going to get along? Not very good. That's more of the uh, authoritarian, you know, kind of a boss that really doesn't care. He's just all about himself. I want to win, and I really don't want you to lose. Uh, number two, so there's the lose-win idea. So that, that could be taken a couple of different ways. I'm a loser, and I'm just going to be a loser. That's no fun. But there is potentially some value to the lose-win scenario. If it's a bigger context of a family or a team, you might want to give in and lose for the greater good of the team, maybe on a short-term basis to make a long-term goal. Then there's the lose-lose, so, so nobody wins. And I think that's just the stubborn people. They're going to come together, and we're not getting anywhere. Anybody know any stubborn people? <laughs> oh, the ladies are putting their heads up and down. <laughs> Probably the most common is win. Because reality is, you know, I might want to win. I don't necessarily want you to lose. I'm going to kind of leave that up to you. I'm going to win. If you win, that's great. But, I, but I'm not really that worried about it. I'm going to leave that. So this is probably the most common um, idea in this concept. And then there's the last one, which I typically use in negotiations. And, and, and we talked about me being a Ford employee, which means I was working in a company that had a very strong union. And I was always in negotiations with the union at least every couple of years. And uh, I would use this, or we would use this, the win-win or no deal. So we kind of set that as the rules of, the rules of engagement. We're either going to come to a win-win or there's no deal. But we all knew we couldn't get to no deal. Because no contract means nobody made anything. We don't make anything. Nobody makes any money. Nobody makes any money. Nobody gets a paycheck. So this would kind of be used kind of stall and make us work together for longer until we could actually come up with the win-win. And the win-win is essentially, you know, we're looking after the mutual benefit of both parties. Sometimes um, uh, countries can easily do this. If I have a country that is really good at making rice and another country is really good at uh, producing coffee, it's a win-win if they, if they have a, a, a good trade agreement. Okay, to form a diverse team. This is one of my favorite uh, charts to talk about. Uh, th this one is simple. We're on a team of people, and, and productivity is on this axis, and time is on that axis. 
And, and if we're all kind of think alike and we have a similar background, let's say maybe we went to the same university, uh, or maybe we're all males, or maybe the whole team's all females, they can run the productivity pretty fast early. But the problem is over time, in comparison to a diverse team, they only just go so fast. And when I saw this, it reminded me of my uh, experience in China. When I went to China as a Westerner, and I went there with about 30 other Westerners, some actually were all from, from the US, some were from Europe, some were from Australia, and we went there to work. So we bring us a Western culture to China. Well, then there's this Chinese culture, which is a lot different. It, in fact, I learned so much about um, how to, um, to work it with other people that are completely different to me. It really enhanced my life. But so I had two cultures in terms of people. But the other thing that this experience had with me is the company I worked for was called Chang'an Ford. So it was two companies that came together. It was 50% owned by Chang'an, which is a Chinese company that made their own cars. And then there's Ford, which makes their cars. We were going to go make Ford cars, but it was a 50-50 partnership. So then I saw I had the culture of, of, of Ford, the culture of Chang'an, culture of Chinese, and the culture of Westerners coming together. How do you think we did? Right here. Where do you think we were right about here? Any ideas? I think we were real productive. Mm -hmm. No. No, we, we probably ran along the black line for a while. <laughs> um, and it's part of, and, and it, if you know Westerners, or at least American Westerners, like myself and Ford Motor Company, very fast driven, very fast paced, go, 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 80% of the information, you're making a decision. In China, it's not that way. In China, they want all the information before they make a decision. They want every single team member to agree. It's called alignment. I didn't really understand what the word alignment meant. Alignment means 100% of everybody on the team totally agrees with the direction we're going. Well, this took forever. But you know what happened? We eventually found alignment. <clears throat> we went so fast and so far went off the chart. So this product that we were making, with this particular, the first plant that I had in China was a transmission plant, automatic transmission plant. Does everybody here drives a stick shift, yes? Anybody drive an automatic? Real. <laughs> automatic <laughs> transmission? Really? But we drive a ZF, you know, in German ZF. Yeah, I know ZF well. Yeah, the best I did a joint venture with that the one. Best one. The best one, the best one. Best automatic? Yeah, yeah, best automatic. Okay. I, I, know, I, I did a joint picture with those guys too. So I know. They have, they have the best. That culture is a little different. It's not, <laughs> I can tell you some stories. <laughs> so, yeah. I will, I will, maybe later I'll tell you that story. <laughs> anyway, um, so, so they were so successful. So this transmission that we made was made in North America and it's been made for six years. It was made in Europe for four years. So it was a proven design. We're just taking that transmission and putting it in China with the same equipment that the other plants in the rest of the world were using, the same machines by the same manufacturers, the same operating system. Everything was the same. But the results, what do you think the results were? The results of the products produced in China were 10 times better than North America and Europe meaning we eliminated warranty, meaning everybody that bought a car had a transmission that never failed. That's unbelievable. The company said, we think it's magic. I said, I think it's really good diversity, where we have a lot of good people working together. And, uh, and it, was, it was just a big success story. So I'm going to finish up. Uh, Marissa Mayer. Who, anybody knew Marissa Mayer? Is it? Marissa Mayer. Oh, Yahoo. Yeah. Yes. I thought they said who. No, Yahoo. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yahoo. <laughs> Not only Yahoo, she was the 20th employee, the 20th person hired into Google and made it to their executive ranks. And then apparently Yahoo uh, needed her to help them and she was the uh, leader of Yahoo. She got fired. She got fired? Yeah, she got huge money for that. <laughs> well, she sold the company and then she stepped down. I don't think she got 
My, I think, my, I think my, my understanding was she said, but very smart person, extremely successful business person. And she said, find the smartest people you can and surround yourself with them. Some really good advice. So you're ready to practice engaging?